Nancy Jarabek. I'm the Executive Director of the Bar Center, and I'm really honored and excited to be here with Dr. Joe Lee. Thanks for having me, Angie. My name is Joseph Lee. I'm the President and CEO of the Hazelden Betty Ford Foundation, the largest nonprofit treatment provider for substance use disorders in the country. I'm also a physician, a child psychiatrist, and board certified in addiction medicine. It's an honor to be here. Well, let's start off a little bit. So you assumed leadership at Hazelden Betty Ford recently. I would love to hear both some of your background as well as the things you're doing now. Well, gosh, it's a, it's a long story, but you know, when the pandemic started, I was a frontline clinician. Uh, I was the medical director for our youth continuum. And uh, I didn't always intend on being a CEO. Um, I had a lot of experiences externally and internally, and so the qualifications were there, but a lot happened in that year. Um, when the pandemic hit, uh, I recognized that we were indeed a very stigmatized um, area of healthcare. You know, we were the very last in line to get masks. We didn't have testing. Hospitals were struggling, but we were especially struggling. And so it was an illuminating moment and incredibly inspirational because the nurses, the counselors, um, everybody in our organization really stepped up to help people because more people were falling through the cracks than ever before. And there was something that spoke to me during the time of the pandemic that said that I needed to do more and that I could spend the rest of my career helping one family at a time, which is awesome, but that I could do more and really create some more seismic shifts. And the other part of the equation is, you know, um, last year there was a lot of turmoil and civil unrest with the murder of George Floyd. And uh, that really spoke to me as well. And I knew that we had to do some different things, that we needed a bold vision for the future. And that really affirmed my commitment. Uh, and um, fortunately, everything kind of went the right way. The spirit of the organization, the recovery community was also aligned to the direction to really broaden our banner, do more for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and take us in a new path. And so uh, we're an organization that's had a lot of success, and we're going to continue that success, uh, but with a broader on-ramp, meeting more people where they're at. And so I am so uh, delighted uh, to have so many wonderful partners in that journey. And I got to tell you, the BAR program is the epitome of that kind of program. Oh, thank you so much. And I am really excited to be working with you. I have to say your path feels similar to mine in that um, I was a high school counselor. And at that point, kind of working with individual students, working with individual families and loved it. And um, at, at one juncture, both was realizing the challenges I was having, but also recognizing the contribution hopefully I could provide to others. And so I don't know that everyone realizes that BAR um, actually has its origination in prevention, and that um, that's why we are uh, um, in partnership with Hazelden Betty Ford, because of our deep commitment to prevention and really having healthy young people. So even kind of back to when I was a high school counselor, and um, it was kind of early on in my career, but half the kids were failing a class. Those same students were failing a class often were the same kids out smoking a cigarette in the railroad tracks. And uh, honors kids who were not failing classes were um, misusing Ritalin. And so not at all exhibiting healthy behaviors. And that was one of the big originations of like why we put bar in place is I'm like, we need all eyes and ears. We need all adults be really looking to see how can we help all of our young people truly thrive. And that that needs to be honors kids who are passing classes, but are they really healthy? And how can they become our leaders as well as students who are exhibiting early signs of risk behaviors way before we get into these, you know, these patterns that are, that are really um, dangerous. But our um, initial work all was through SAMHSA and, and NREP in terms of finding that BARS initial findings were that it reduces cigarette use, it reduces binge drinking, and it reduces suicide ideation as well as attempts. As a school person, I knew one of the early ways to, to monitor that was passing classes and attending and behavior, those basic ABCs. But in terms of having bar now scaling and working with 200,000 students, back to your point, it started kind of based on the work that I was doing individually, but I'm like, how can we have this be scalable? So I love the fact that, that, that your work also started kind of from your personal belief systems. I would love to hear, in particular, because I know so much is happening in terms of this kind of new approach and that entire thing in terms of culture changes and how you're leading with culture changes. And you hinted at it a little bit, but how um, the work is becoming kind of always recovery, but those other pieces, I would love to hear about how that's growing. 
Yeah, well, there's um, a lot like you said on the scientific end mm -hmm. that we're doing, incorporating more evidence-based practices, mm -hmm. meeting people where they're at, uh, doing more for mental health services and expanding in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, we too are also looking at data analytics and outcomes as we work with um, insurance companies and payers. Um, and we do pretty well in that and we show good outcomes for the people who come into our care. But you know, the thing that moves me about what you've said is beyond the science, what people really care about is the heart. And I really believe the spirit of a thing is really the most important thing um, because that's what really is the difference between good to great. And uh, that's what I see in our organization and in the bar program. And I think that's where the synergy is. And so um, that spirit that we have in recovery, in the recovery community, we emphasize things like humility, empathy, and grace. There's a journey that uh, I see a lot of people take on where um, they are really humble. Um, they don't think less of themselves, but they might spend a little bit less time. And, and they really see themselves as other people in their recovery journey. And that leveling of the plane allows them to empathize better with others because now they're the same. And that a powerful empathy allows for a lot of self-empathy as well, which then opens the door for uh, the concept of grace, that they realize all of us need some second chances now and again. And, uh, and they feed it forward to each other and they pass it forward. And it's an incredible thing to see when people accept grace and pass it to others. And so I've seen in the recovery we, uh, community the flywheel the flywheel of recovery and how it really helps people and how they spread that love out to others. And I think the great thing that you have with the BAR program is that you're harnessing resources that are already there. Who loves the students more outside of the parents and the teachers? And when you're arming them with the skills and the right spirit and the attitudes, that's the flywheel that schools start. And that's why you get such great scientific results. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are absolutely um speaking the language in terms of what um, our work is, we have a, a tagline, which is more than a tagline. So we talk about same students. When we talk about same students, we're really talking about each and every student. We have a deep commitment to equity, and we have to be really serving all of our students. The next one is same teachers, and I think that's a, a piece that's really important to both me and our organization, is the workforce, people who chose to commit their profession to serving young people are incredibly talented. They are incredibly committed and they love students. We have to provide them a way to realize that talent and not be replacing them, not be coming in and doing it for them, but really providing the system that they can be able to see the student for the whole student and work with colleagues in a new way and know that they are the experts. They know their community best. They know their kids best. We're not gonna come in to say, oh, we should do it this way. We know that they know what needs to be done, and how can we provide a, a, a system to kind of unleash that? And then to your point, the, the, the better results is our last part of the tagline, because we need them to be able to, to show concretely what's happening for them and what's happening for their kids. But those, those three pieces are more than just words, and I'm hearing in particular that the ability to empathize and the ability to have grace, but also really respect communities. I mean, we work in communities all across the country, and to absolutely have humility when you enter, to be able to say, we're bringing a system for you to realize your talent, but we know the talent is here. We know that, that you're able to, to do this work. But I think that's a, a critical piece. I have heard you tell the story before, but I would love if you wouldn't mind sharing it again about when you were working in Baltimore and so kind of some of your, at least sounds like where some of your origination of, um, or demonstration of your commitment to equity there, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I was uh, training in, in Durham, North Carolina at uh, Duke University. And so most of my uh, patients already were not uh, white. And then uh, for my child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship, I went to Johns Hopkins. And Johns Hopkins is right in the middle of Baltimore. And uh, I remember something uh, quite striking in my experiences there. In the mornings, I would um, walk to these schools in inner city Baltimore, and, and I'd work with the school counselors and the principals. And, and um, it was pulling uh, grandmothers and aunts and extended family and getting them bus tickets and making sure that the, the kids had lunch and you're trying to patch together the right care out of love. And we did the best we could. And then in the afternoon, I'd go to the Johns Hopkins proper, you know, and uh, 
the ivory tower of Johns Hopkins. And, and there I would uh, kind of help run a VIP clinic for these people who would come from across the world to get their care at Johns Hopkins for, for its name. And, and Johns Hopkins did everything the right way. They, they were equitable in how they delivered the care. But, uh, you know, it doesn't take one uh, much to see the disparity between the mornings and the afternoon. And, and I had to reconcile that in my heart. And in my heart, I said, you know, uh, from here on out, I really have to treat every child and family like they're VIP. That's how I uh, reconciled it. And, and that's something that, you know, I, I'm far from perfect and I'm a broken person, but I've tried to stay true to. And I've tried to imbue that within our organization. And I think that that's been powerful. And it's just one of the parallels uh, that we have with the BAR program in the spirit and the feeling of it is that we believe in the capacity of schools and communities and families to turn around, that the solutions for those communities and those families and those teachers come from within the person. And so what I really appreciate about the BAR program is the belief in teachers and their capacity for change and to help. And those teachers in turn believe in the capacity of the students to do a lot of good. And that's really incredible to see. I have to mention that another part of my backstory and, and another reason I really love BAR is, is I'm a big fan of teachers. And the reason I say this isn't just a tagline about education, it's because my story personally is an immigrant story. And uh, my family moved from Seoul, South Korea to Norman, Oklahoma uh, when I was seven years old. And I remember these experiences of teachers really believing in me. Uh, I didn't speak any English at all, uh, entered the second grade. And I think we all kind of remember really powerful teachers in our lives that believed in us more than we believed in ourselves at the time. And those people shape us. And uh, if we were to all kind of sit back and think about those people uh, in our lives who believed in us, who inspired in us, and you, and you think about the qualities they have, the character traits they have, their patience, um, their optimism, you know, how they challenged us and made us grow, uh, the love they had for us and the empathy, and you think about all these great traits, well, the BAR program brings those uh, traits out of teachers, and then in turn, they bring those traits out of students. And so uh, we have a lot, we could just keep going on and on about the BAR program, but I just want to tell you how appreciative we are of the partnership because it is exactly the right spirit. I so appreciate you both sharing your personal story and recognizing that. What I'll say, which I really helpful in terms of what BAR does is these individual teachers, they're, especially in the last couple of years, there's a hesitancy at times to notice things because they don't know what to do with it. So they're like, okay, if I find out about this thing, how is a math teacher, can I get the resources to the table? And I think that's one of the things that, that BAR does is provide these systems in place where we're saying these teachers, your job is to identify and to care and to love and then tell other people and we will help orchestrate a system to both get the services to that student, to that family, but provide you the ability to also feel healthy as a staff member because right now there's, you know, at times a, um, a concern to be like, if I see something, I don't know what to do with it. And we're right now are like, we need everybody and all of these adults that are, are care about these kids to be able to, to see and to be able to get help. So this is no longer a well-meaning adult, so they don't get um, kind of overwhelmed. You had talked about um, empathy, which is both such a critical skill, especially now. Um, I will share, so, you know, BAR is working in um, K-12 now. We'd started off in high schools and we're working in elementary schools. And I had just heard a story a couple weeks ago, which I think is really telling and important. So as part of our our work, we have um, lessons that are facilitated by the adult. So they're not SEL lessons that are taught, which is, I think is an important part because what we're trying to do is foster a relationship that the student is feeling connected to the adult as well as the adult is, is getting to know the student in a different way. And this lesson was called, um, It Depends on the View, and all of our um, lessons for elementary are based on a book. And there was um, pictures of clouds and from page to page, some students are saying, it's a duck, and the next page is, it's a rabbit. And this book went back and forth, no, it's a duck's you know, ears, no, it's a rabbit's bill, and kind of went back and forth. And the entire point was just to say, you could have the same thing, and yet you can have a different perspective. The secondary teacher was really um, surprised that the majority of the students thought, if we had a different perspective, we were in a fight. And the teacher kept trying to explain to say, well, no, like, I may clean the kitchen and I may think it's clean, 
And my husband comes in and thinks it's not clean. And that's the same clean you know, kitchen, it's just our perspective. And they're like, well, then you're in a fight. And this awareness that in particular for, for this group and for the teacher to have this, this um, new knowledge that the students thought if you have a different perspective, that means we're fighting. And so that I think is such an important learning for, for many people to know that this isn't a fight and that we can have different perspectives and then how to grow from there to actually even be able to empathize, to be able to see, oh, I see why you think it's a duck or a rabbit, let alone to not have this immediate um, kind of digging your heels in to be like, well, now we're in a conflict. But the ability to empathize, I think, is, is such a necessary skill. I think it's a skill right now that, in, in general, our society really needs in ways that we can provide mechanisms and strategies that, in particular, our schools, I keep going, schools are the place where all our kids are at. We can help foster that. So not to you know, be changing people's opinions, but to be able to say, we have different opinions, and we can not be in a fight, but recognize that we have different opinions. But um, the, uh, the, the, the importance of empathy, I feel like can't be understated. Yeah. But I also, in terms of when people are in recovery, that that is such a, a critical part of, of their journey. So I, I'm so appreciative that you brought that forward. Yeah, you know, empathy, there are prerequisites for it, which I think Barr establishes. And then once you get that culture of empathy mm -hmm. and you build it as a skill, because it's not just a feeling, it's a skill you build over time. It's like a muscle you exercise. There's a flywheel that's created. And there's a lot of good that comes from that. And um, I appreciate that so much because it parallels the journey of a lot of people who are in recovery. But what it reminds me first of is I have a lot of parents who come to me. I'm sure they come to you too. Because uh, I'm a, as a child psychiatrist who does addiction medicine, and uh, I have a lot of people come to me from across the country, and I'm treating somebody maybe in my past, but then their family members come because there's somebody else they're concerned about in their family, and they might be younger, and this is really a plug for prevention here, and uh, and they and they kind of ask me these questions, and I know what's really in their heart. Their their heart, it, what's in their heart is what can I do to prevent a high risk loved one from manifesting some of these symptoms. You know, and there's a lot of skills and a lot of knowledge that they have to partake. And then I mirror that with my own journey in seeing a lot of high-risk youth and young adults throughout my career, seeing thousands of them. And oftentimes I've wondered, shouldn't we have done more years before? Because the data clearly says that you can identify high-risk people who might develop addiction in grade school, but we wait until the problems arise. And when you actually dig into the material of really good prevention, because people ask me, what are the magic words? What do I say at Thanksgiving dinner if they ask for a glass of wine, you know? And what I tell them instead, it's the investment in the relationships. And if I had to break it down for you, it's not all these tactics and skills and magic words. It's the building of these values. I ask parents, model humility, teach empathy, show grace, and ask your kids to pass it on. And, and so Barr teaches students and teachers how to embody these skills. And, and that creates such a powerful force uh, within the community because in, in recovery, I don't lecture at patients for them to get better. I have to believe that they have the capacity within themselves, that they're the battery I have to charge. So the solutions don't come from me. My job is to make them believe in their capacity for change. And, and you can imagine all the horrific stories uh, that, that come in, how much shame there is and how they lack confidence. And, but, but if you can believe that they have capacity and it's authentic and you give them the skills, they will charge themselves up. And what Barr does is, just like we believe in people with addiction, that they have hope for recovery, you believe in schools, you believe in teachers, because ultimately you believe in students, and that creates such a rich and nurturing community that's hard to explain just with numbers. I'm so appreciative of the, the parallels. One of the things that it is interesting in bar schools, and it is um, the students report that they feel more as expected of them, and they feel more supported, which I wanna say as a parent, you can talk to my kids, same thing. <laughs> I'm like, you can do incredible things. I will be there, but you can do incredible things. And it's not me doing, but it is me telling you, you are so capable. And I keep going, the amount of talent that exists in our world is like, there is so much capable. So getting that message to students and the idea of grace too, because I think that having been the high school counselor, there are mistakes made. It's expected. 
you know, that is part of living, that is part of loving, that is part of growing. But to be able to give permission to say, yes, that happened. Let's do what we can to, to remedy and let's see what we can do to have that not happen in the future. But not getting hung up on, I did this I or I am this. I think that that, that I am internalizing that behavior for self and or how we disrupt that in terms of what those behaviors look like. And if you aren't putting a system in place that the adults can see this bigger kid, having them identify the kid as something and not other and that capability I think is is such a, a, a critical piece. But I, it is um, fascinating what the work that we're trying to do in schools, but that early identification I think is such a key piece too. So the fact that, you know, we have elementary teachers that are identifying, you know, concerning patterns, I'm like, that's that's important. So we can get those supports in place now versus waiting till ninth grade and they're failing their classes and they're all by the railroad track doing all those other pieces I kept going. The fact that we are, you know, at this place, at least we're able to get adults involved now, but not waiting till it's it's so much farther down the path. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, I think as I'm hearing you talk, mm -hmm. I'm trying to empathize with the viewpoints of some of our audience. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm a teacher, if I'm an administrator, if I'm a concerned parent, if I'm a coach, I'm kind of looking at it through their lens. And I think there's some important questions I'm asking myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm asking myself, where is this change gonna come from? What are the solutions? And, and do we want solutions that are fed to us or do we wanna create a flywheel where we believe and invest in our own people to create a long lasting community that really models the kind of values and the mission that we want? And I think when I think about it through that lens, there's such a power in a program like BAR because it's not a series of lectures. It's not a tool you hand off for somebody. It's a true belief in the capacity of people to change. And uh, while you and I are using a lot of semantic language, I'm actually also a motivational interviewing trainer. And there's a whole litany of literature on the science of change, changing behaviors. And these values we talk about, like absolute worth, empathy, you know, the capacity for change, uh, it's well documented that these things matter for people and, and they do make a profound positive impacts uh, on people. And so uh, what a wonderful gift BAR is to these schools and these communities. And, and uh, we don't have to say it a lot, but there's so much testimony. Uh, we've seen the videos, we've seen the people impacted by it in such a wonderful way. Dr. Lee, thank you so much for coming today. I'm really excited about continuing to work with Hazelden as well as the work that we're gonna be able to do in communities and with schools. Well, I'm so excited for this partnership because uh, BAR's got all the right elements, it's got the right spirit, and it's got the right science. And uh, I think moving forward, uh, we're gonna do a lot of good together.